Well, thank you all for being here. And I'm sorry we arrived a little bit late. We misjudged how long it takes to get from Salt Lake to here. I won't do a formal speech because I want to be able to have time for interaction and questions from you to focus the, the um, discussion the way that would be most useful to you. I'll just make a couple of introductory remarks. Um, we're here to, in, in Utah today. We're going to California, and then I'm going back to my home state of Arkansas making a trip. I came up yesterday from Quito because we are are talking with Americans about the advantages of trade agreements with, with Colombia, Peru, and Panama in particular, and the benefits of trade in general, both to the United States and to our partners in the Western Hemisphere. Living in Quito, I see every day the transformational quality that trade can have on an economy and on people's lives. Um, the Right now, we have Andean trade preferences, which the United States has offered to Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and Colombia for a number of years. Those were just extended through December 31st of this year, but every now and then they have to be extended and extended. So one of the things that, uh, that these two trade agreements would do with Peru and, and Colombia would be to fix those benefits in, in for a longer period of time for permanent, permanently. And the benefits that have accrued in, in Ecuador alone there have been 350,000 jobs have been created because of these uh, preferences. And those jobs have gone to people who might otherwise either not have one and be extraordinarily poor or to be so poor that they are tempted to go into the illicit drug trade or immigrate to the United States. So it has huge benefits both for creating a better quality of life, which we want to do, and to make these countries more democratic, more stable, and better partners for us. Um, and and offers jobs to people. A lot of the, the opportunities have gone, especially in the flower industry and the broccoli industry, to indigenous women. And so these are people who are supporting families and being able to maintain a lifestyle for their children that they weren't able to do before. And the benefits of trade not only, though, accrue to our neighbors abroad, but to the United States. Because as if we put these trade agreements into effect, it will also give us access to their markets. In other words, right now they're exporting to us free of, free of tariffs, but we have to pay tariffs going back into those countries because we don't have a mutual agreement. We just have those unilateral preferences we're offering. So if the trade agreements are approved and go into effect, then our exporters will be able to export products to those countries. And for the most part, it will not be displacing things in those countries. It will be offering them goods at a cheaper price that they will then be able to afford better. The kinds of things we export to Ecuador, for example, are machine tools. Not things that they make there, but they buy machine tools. If, they're, if it's a little bit cheaper from us, they'll buy it from us instead of perhaps from China or another country. So it'll be a, we expect that there will be hundreds of millions of dollars of benefit to American exporters. And American exporters, if they're making more products to export, then they, can, they create more jobs here. So the traditional um, fears about trade agreements and about globalization, that it loses American jobs. I won't say that it doesn't lose any American jobs, because it's absolutely correct that some jobs have, and factories have moved overseas. But what jobs have been created are in going concerns in businesses that are exporting and that add jobs as they are, as they have more more to export as their products increases, and we were saying that you know when when somebody's factory closes and they lose their job, they write their congressman. They say, "I have lost my job because of you know international trade." But the people who get added on to these other businesses that are exporting, that are increasing um, their their production and their income. They don't write to their Congress and say, I got a job today because of, I'm exporting to Ecuador. They don't, either don't take the trouble or they don't see that direct connection because all they know is they've been hired, but the company knows it. But they don't write to their congressmen. So the disproportionate uh, emphasis has been on what's lost rather than what's gained. And overall, the gains are much, much greater. So we're uh, traveling around, talking to people, talking to groups like you, talking to chambers of commerce, talking to media to try to make the case that that increased international trade benefits everyone. It benefits American consumers because we can buy more products from abroad that are, that are less expensive. It, it benefits our exporters because they can create jobs and sell more things abroad. And it benefits people in the foreign countries who are able to get jobs and improve their, their incomes and their lifestyles. 
so um, in, in the question and answer session, we can discuss more of the specific points, but I can tell you again that from my personal experience working in Ecuador, I have seen that the ability of trade and international trade to improve lives uh, on both sides of both sides of our borders. So thank you very much. Hi. Ambassador Jewell gave you the, the, the view from Quito. I'm working in Washington, so what I, what I want to share with you is the, the view from Washington. These are actually three separate agreements with Peru, Colombia, and Ecuador. It's not a, a, a package deal. Panama. I'm sorry, Panama. I apologize. Thank you. Uh, in Panama, um, got me thinking about Ecuador too much. I, I wish one were with Ecuador, and Ecuador would be in better shape if it were. Um, the Peru agreement was passed by the Congress and signed in law in mid-December 2007. The President has determined that we are going to send the Columbia Agreement up to Congress. It's always a matter of timing. You want to send it up just right because there's a, a, a clock starts running and you don't want to send it up so soon that, uh, that it wouldn't get voted on before that clock runs out. And so we will send it up probably this month or next month, we'll send it up to Congress. And that's why we're focusing so much on Colombia. And then after that comes Panama. Um, there's a political issue with Panama, so Congress has got some, some problems with that. But we'll, we'll see what happens in the fall there. Um, the economic arguments for the United States in favor of these agreements is fairly straightforward. These countries, under the Andean Trade Preferences Act and the Caribbean countries, which Panama is one of, under the Caribbean Basin Initiative, have duty-free access to the U.S. market for almost all of their exports. So their products come into our country duty-free, without paying any taxes. Our products going into their countries pay up to 180% duty. That is 180 percent of the value of the product going into their country. That's pretty rare and it's for only some agricultural products. The average weight is, average duty is around 12 percent that our products are paying going in, in to their market. So their products get in here, shouldn't ours get in there? I mean that's, it's that straightforward on the economic side. On the political side, let me go back to the political side because this is as important politically for the United States as it is economically. On the political side, what we are trying to do in Latin America is have countries that are representative democracies with open economies, market economies, be successful. Be successful. Not support us in a vote at the United Nations, not change their government. We simply want them to be successful. What does that mean? It means that their economies are growing, that people are making more money, that poverty is reduced. Poverty is the real issue in Latin America, as any of you who have been there know. And so that citizens of these three countries, and others as well, believe they've got a stake in the democratic system of their country. Not that they've got a stake in electing President X or President Y, but that they've got a stake in the democratic system of their country. So that they feel it brings benefits to them. In business schools, um, in chambers of commerce, uh, in academic institutions, when you talk about trade, you end up very quickly sounding like a banker or an academic, talking in terms that average people can't understand, foreign direct investment, and Gini coefficients, and all the tariff rates and schedules, all of which are important, and it's important to have a language to talk about those, the same way that video makers have got their own language for talking about their things. But that doesn't talk to your next door neighbor. Doesn't talk to your mom's next door neighbor. 
doesn't mean anything to them. What we're talking about here is how to link good, positive macroeconomic data in Peru and Colombia and Panama, where the economy is growing, to the microeconomy where we all live. Some of us are old enough to remember Ronald Reagan asking, are, are you better off now than you were four years ago, right? Are you better off now than you, all, than you were four years ago? And that, in fact, is the question that every voter, whether it's in Utah or Ohio or Ecuador, asks him or herself when they go in to vote, am I better off now than I was? Do I have hope that things are going to continue to get better? And that's what these trade agreements do, is it's not going to solve all the problems of Peru, Colombia, and Ecuador. People of Peru, Colombia, and Ecuador, Panama, you got me thinking, I apologize, are the ones who are going to resolve the problems of their country, not us. But it is a helping hand. It is the United States extending its hand to the citizens of those countries helping them, helping their economy grow faster, helping their formal economy grow faster, helping people move from the black economy, informal economy, where there are no benefits, to a formal economy where the labor laws actually apply and where people do have benefits. And that's what this is about. And the news of the past week coming out of the Andes, unfortunately, um, simply underlines that. It, it, it makes it, takes its highlighter, it takes your highlighter out of the pocket and just puts it right over that. What we want to see happen is for the governments of Peru, Colombia, and Panama to be successful in delivering government services to their citizens. Better health care, better education, infrastructure, so that they feel they've got a stake in the government of their country. Thank you very much. Questions for Ambassador Jewell or myself? Yes, sir. Uh, you've been uh, addressing the free trade agreement side a little bit, but uh, your last remarks, it tends, you're, you're talking far more comprehensively. And so um, as, you, as you look at the programs you're involved in, is uh, the free trade agreement side just a small part of it? Uh, uh, although an integral part of it, or is that really what you're pushing very aggressively right now in addition to the other kinds of development initiatives, uh, or is that even a part of your portfolio? It's, it's complementary. I mean, we have develop, official bilateral development assistance that we are providing various countries in Latin America. It's $1.8 billion a year that the taxpayers of the United States provide to Latin American countries for various programs. We have had debt relief, so we've um, 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 forgiven the debt of the poorest Latin American countries, and it's totaled somewhere around $9 billion between Inter-American Development Bank debt and um, World Bank debt that's been forgiven for Latin American countries. We've got Millennium Challenge account, which is providing assistance and, and, and guarantees sort of long-term assistance to countries. Um, and we've got unilateral trade benefits that we've given to the Andean countries and to the Caribbean. And what we're trying to do now is lock in those benefits. So they, if you're an investor, you want to know that, let, let me, the, the people who grow flowers in Colombia and Ecuador, if any of you gave or received flowers for Valentine's Day, so like 60 percent of the flowers in the United States come from Colombia. Probably what another 15, 20 percent come from. Actually, more than that of roses. Yeah, of roses I, are I in particular are coming from Ecuador. Of this the 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 benefits were expiring on the 29th of February, and so they actually said, "We know we've got Valentine's Day. We're okay. What do we do for Mother's Day in the United States if these benefits have expired?" Right? So what this does is it makes it permanent for them, but it also gives us access to their market for our exports. Um, it locks it in, and it also, these agreements have included in them a, a, a series of other uh, provisions for 
uh, labor standards, environmental protection, um, e-commerce, intellectual property right protection, government procurement and, uh, that, that are useful for us, financial services. Um, so that uh, financial service providers in the United States can provide financial services in those countries. So, I mean, on the whole, it's good for us and it's good for them and it brings, helps them move their economies into the, into the world economy. Yes. Um, I, I, I can't answer your question directly because it depends on product by product, country by country. And one of the things those of you on the B school understand is you, you never can predict how business, where entrepreneurs find new business and find jobs. Okay, let, let me give you an example. I had a guy call me last week from Paducah, Kentucky, and since we're online, I don't want to use his name or the name of his company. Um, who wanted to know was there anything he could do to help? And he's got a company that um, makes, I couldn't even, t I wouldn't even know it if I saw it, all right? But it is essentially something that helps uh, big conveyor belts that you move coal or cement or at, at, a, at a mine that you would use for copper ore, iron ore. It helps the, 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 that conveyor belt from getting clogged up, okay, so that you don't have to stop and go and, and fix it, right? And he said, Look, you know, they've, they've reached the, I don't want to say they can't sell any more in the United States because they can, but they're looking for new markets to expand their sales. And, you know, I never thought of it. I mean, who would know? I certainly no government bureaucrat, which I am, would ever be able to identify it. And so he's able to sell them to Colombia, um, to cement plants in Colombia and in Chile for copper mines. Okay? That's fabulous. I, I, are they diverting, you know, or are the Japanese or the Chinese or the Germans making a similar thing? I don't know, but if they are, that, I'd rather it be bought from a company in Kentucky than from a company in Germany or China or Japan. That's what, that's what trade's about. Because it means that if he can provide a better product or a similar product at a better price, the purchaser's getting a better deal, right? That's what business is all about. So, I mean, the short answer, yeah, I hope so. Okay, not from necessarily countries we don't like, but from anybody. I mean, that, you know, we want to be able to compete in the world. We want these countries to compete in the world. And one of the things to keep in mind is that these countries are not only negotiating agreements with the United States, they're negotiating them with each other, with other Latin American countries with China, with Korea, with the, their, the Andean communities negotiating with the European Union to have a free trade agreement with the European Union. And that's good. It's not that we only want them to trade with the United States. If Colombia or Peru is wealthier because it's trading with China, that's great because it means they're going to be more prosperous, more stable, and have more money to buy other products from the United States. That's fine. Yeah. Could you talk a little more about the agreements that have been made within Latin America, like amongst those countries? Has that always kind of been a free trade thing, or has that had to come about, and how, how is that? Well, I, I had an intern working for me make a, try to put it on a slide, and it was so complicated you could, simply could not understand it, okay? Um, there are all kinds of agreements within Latin, there, there are no Latin America wide agreements, there are agreements within Latin America so that the five Andean countries have something called the Andean community. Mercosur is Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Venezuela, there's some steps it has to take to become part of Mercosur, okay? Um, there are a whole bunch of bilateral agreements, so 
Mexico's got an agreement with Colombia. Mexico's got an agreement with Chile. Chile, in total, has got agreements with 56 different countries, including China and Korea, including the European Union, including the United States, including Canada. Canada's busy negotiating. I think they're about done with Peru, and they think they'll be done shortly with, with Colombia. So you've, you've got this giant, um, you know, it's almost like a plate of spaghetti with all these various agreements that are going on. And, and what we had hoped to do was to be able to negotiate a free trade area of the Americas, right? Um, that didn't work because Mercosur did not want to proceed. And so we've been negotiating with groups of countries, CAFTA, um, and these are three individual agreements. Plus, of course, we have a bilateral agreement with Chile, and we've got NAFTA with Canada and Mexico. Um, it, it's, it's interesting to note, if you, if you look at the map that I didn't bring, um, who's got free trade agreements in the United States in the Western Hemisphere? It goes from Alaska, after these are approved, to the end of Chile on the Pacific side, right? All the whole Pacific coast, with the exception of Ecuador, unfortunately. Um, then you've got, and I think this this is important. If you trade is global, right? I mean, globalization is the Canada, United States, Mexico, Peru, and Chile are all members of APEC, right? And so. I mean, it's sort of interesting, the, 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 the trans-Pacific focus of that, right? And because that's, of course, where trade is booming, is Western Hemisphere with East Asia, Western Hemisphere with East Asia. And the APEC meeting this year is going to be in Lima in November. Um, you know, when, when we talk about APEC, we, we tend to mainly think about the Asian members, but not about the Western Hemisphere members. Somebody, please, uh, I need an Ecuador question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is not intellectual a question, but what do we import from Ecuador besides those lovely flowers? Oil. We import oil from Ecuador. We import uh, flowers. We import shrimp and other fish products, tuna, um, broccoli, cacao for chocolate, and coffee. Bananas, of course. Ecuador is the world's largest exporter of bananas. Um, so, I mean, and Panama hats. And Panama hats. Panama hats are actually made in Ecuador. Always have been. They got that. They got that name because they were used to make when people were building the Panama Canal. Everybody started wearing them. They all come from Ecuador. So it's a it's a, a range of products, and many again, many of those products have been helped. In, and someone asked earlier about whether whether it fit into a, you know broader context, we try now to make our aid fit into a, a context that will become self-sustainable. So part of our aid, for example, in Ecuador goes to microcredit so that more people can get what they need to start growing some of these export products. They can, they can get the land, they can get their land tilled, they can buy the, the machinery or whatever that they need in order to to get it to get themselves into the export market. We also provide technical assistance so they can prove the value and the quality of their products. And that's been particularly successful in chocolate because there's this worldwide boom in everybody eating chocolate and people, you know, the niche chocolates and it has 80% cacao and it's really dark chocolate, all these different, it's really exploded over the last, you know, five to 10 years. And a lot of that actually comes from Ecuador. And so to teach them how to grow for the market you know, to grow the kind that is that has the highest value added, where they're going to get the better price. Um, we also have programs that do that that kind of thing. And now we're working with groups of small producers to form kind of cooperative exporting cooperatives, so they can take advantage of uh, economies of scale and marketing, especially and helping them with marketing overseas. And it's been enormously successful because it doesn't. It's not particularly expensive for us to bring down a consultant or even to get a consultant to bring buyers from the United States for their products. So that we actually, what, what this is doing to some extent is diversifying U.S. suppliers away from China. It's creating market, but it's also people who used to have sole supply in China into the United States are now becoming concerned that they do have sole supply. And so they're wondering maybe having another producer would be smart. And because 
uh, countries of the Western Hemisphere are more or less on the same time zone, they're not that hard to get to. I mean, you can get to Ecuador in, within, in six hours, really. Um, it's a lot easier for them to do business with the countries of the Western Hemisphere. So we're trying to also encourage that mentality that there are benefits to doing, doing business right a lot closer to home than China. Maybe you could give us some insight into like the problems right now in Ecuador and Colombia and Venezuela. I don't know, Maybe just from like guess your view. Yes, well, I was dealing with this up until about eight o'clock on Monday night before I took off on Tuesday morning. Um, the the basics for people who haven't might been following Ecuador news is that on early on Saturday morning, the Colombian military made a strike into. Ecuadorian, about a kilometer, actually about a mile into Ecuadorian territory to kill one of the leaders of the FARC, which is the revolutionary group that's been trying to overthrow the Colombian government for 50 years, uh, close to 50 years. Um, and the Ecuadorians are, needless to say, uh, unhappy at having their territory um, invaded even for a short time by the Colombians with no prior notice. Um, and so there is there, the two countries are now um, at meeting at the OAS, at the American Organization of American States in Washington, to try to work out some kind of uh, diplomatic resolution to this uh, to this problem, which would involve, you know, a Colombian apology. I mean, Colombia has already said we're we're sorry, but they they really felt that they had to do it because it was such a key target. He was such a key person in the FARC that the, the notion of actually being able to take him out was so important to them that they felt that they had to do it. But it is a very complicated. Uh, situation and all the countries of their neighbors and the other countries in the hemisphere are trying to work with them to come to some kind of solution to, to lower the tensions that are going on right now. But it is it is complicated and the Ecuadorians are really mad. I was I met with the president about 5:30 on Monday afternoon and he was he was still hopping mad and hasn't gotten much better I don't think since then. So yeah. The, the agreements all contain those kinds of, of, of provisions, and that's one of the things that's so good about them. It provides a very broad framework, um, as Ambassador Shapiro was talking about, environmental standards, labor standards, um, intellectual property protection, uh, standards for trade and services. It's really a very broad, it's really a lot more than just tariffs. So it provides a, tr a framework so that everybody understands what the rules are. You know what the rules are going to be like to do business for an American in Colombia or in Peru. And so again, it's a, it, it attracts investment because investors want that certainty. They want to know that five years from now, nobody's going to cha turn the tables on them and have a new set of rules come into effect. It, it provides a lot more stability. So we do expect them to, to meet standards of uh, sort of rules of the game. And we've negotiated those. And some of them phase in because some of them are, they're, they're not, they can't just go from day to night with a whole new standard. So over time, you have a you know, certain number of years to phase in this kind of standard, a certain number, but eventually over time, they will, all those standards will be met. So it is a, a much broader than just um, tariff reductions. Yeah. How would a new political, uh, like presidential administration affect these trade agreements, in particular, like if John McCain wins compared to, you know, somebody like Barack Hussein Obama wins, like what's the difference? Well, it, if we, if we, if the Congress passes them, uh, as they pass, for example, the, the agreement with Peru, it will make no difference at all because we now have a, a treaty commitment, an agreement, a formal agreement with we, with these governments to maintain these benefits on both sides. And so, one of the reasons to to do these is to take it out of the realm of politics and put it into a a a treaty-like commitment with another country that is, I mean, it's not that it's unbreakable, but it takes a lot to break agreements which we've made with other countries that have been signed in, ratified by our Congress and signed into law by a President of the United States are not lightly overthrown. And so it should make no difference.
Equi equ yeah, that's a very, very good question, and it's something the Ecuadorians, especially the Ecuadorian private sector, is extremely concerned about. Because if the if the Peru and Colombia, when the Peru and Colombia agreements go into effect, um, they're going to then have northern and southern borders who have these benefits, and so they are extremely concerned that investment. You know, an American investor looking to invest in South America is much more likely to go to a country where we have this kind of broad framework agreement than it is to come to an Ecuador. Even the Ecuadorian private sector is probably going to lose some investment of national investment into those two countries because they're too, it's, it's too tempting. If you know that you can go there and make money, then you're going to do it. Now, it doesn't mean that they absolutely um, lose overall but the opportunity cost may be quite great. And some industries, in fact, may move from Ecuador, say, to Peru or to Colombia because they get, these, these, they, they get the benefit of exporting to the United States duty-free. So Ecuador is quite concerned about it, uh, especially the private sector. Um, do you see anything happening, well, like with NAFTA and um, the farmers in Mexico are upset because of the they can't compete with the price of corn in the United States. Do you see anything like that happening in in any of uh, Panama, Colombia, or Peru, or with this new agreement that you're talking about? These the products that that are coming from those countries to the United States are not um, are not are, are more complementary than than uh, competitive, really. So there shouldn't be a huge uh, problem. And the issue of corn in Mexico is, is more compli complicated than, than it might seem. Even though we can, in fact, produce corn more efficiently at a lower cost than Mexican producers. The answer is not to stop American corn going to Mexico. The answer is to get Mexican producers into a crop where they can add more value and export to the United States at a, and make more money. And there, there are any, there dozens more of crops that are now have increased dramatically in their exports from Mexico into the United States because they can do it more efficiently than we can. And that includes avocados, that includes tomatoes, there's a lot of, and some seasonal products that they can, you know, they can produce off season for us um, and export into the United States. So what needs to happen is not to keep American corn out, but to transition those people who are growing very inefficiently on, on small subsistence farms with just a little bit over to, to sell to, to a product that is more sustainable and would give them more money and improve their income. It's, transitions like this are hard and there's no, you know, it would be ridiculous to stand up here and say nobody loses, it gain, absolutely every single human being gains. Some people will lose because the least productive people will lose and that's why some factories in the United States do close. But other jobs are created, and the trick is to move people to the, the jobs where we do have the competitive advantage or they have the competitive advantage. If I can add something. Go back to that. The, the, in the NAFTA agreement, the, the duty on U.S. corn just came off this January 1, so it's after 14 years, and there was no... Um, the, 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 it, it, the duty wasn't removed gradually, it just it stayed the same and at year 14 ended. As a result of that, was, is we, when we negotiated these three agreements, we insisted that on their agricultural products that would be, have the most competition from the United States, that the, that the duty on U.S. products be removed gradually rather than staying the same and in, in ending all at once so that those farmers would have the incentive to adjust. Let, let, let me give you an example. We produce chicken very, very efficiently in the United States, okay? Um, just do. Um, to raise chicken, in a, particularly in a tropical climate, is expensive and much less efficient. One reason that our we can raise chicken so inexpensively is because we have corn right here. The feed is here. Um, they have to import the right kind of corn to feed chickens, right? So the, the, what in Colombia, what they'll do is they will remove the duty on U.S. chicken 
I think over 18 years, but they'll take it off a little bit each year so that Colombian chicken producers, and we're not talking about campesinos, we're talking, you know, big farms with those big aluminum, you know, thousands of chicken productions, so that it, it gets removed gradually so that they can, will learn how to compete and, and will be able to do so. The Colombian Minister of Agriculture, interestingly, says, well, you know, what we really ought to be doing is producing tropical products, not temperate climate products, you know, so that they're fruit, palm oil, all sorts of things that where Colombia and, and uh, Peru and Panama have an advantage over the United States, right? Where you get multiple crops a year, particularly out of tropical products, and that that's where they ought to focus rather than trying to compete with the United States on chicken or compete with the United States on, on corn which we can raise so uh, so efficiently and inexpensively in the United States. Great. Thank you very much. For Thank you all. Thanks, thanks for coming.